I was born in N'Djamena, the capital city of the beautiful country of Chad. That's one of the um, places that people visit often in N'Djamena. That's a picture of baby me. That's the first picture that I had for my passport. And you can see it says the um, Republic of Chad, which is how it's spelled in French. Um, I know that not many have heard or known of Chad or N'Djamena, and that's okay because today I'm going to tell you a little bit of it, about it. The name Chad with its Western connotations seems like it's a joke, but I promise you it's a real place. For the past um, speeches, I've only talked about women because of how passionate I was with the topics that actually come up when you just search the word women, from women's rights to everything in between. We all know that Africa is home to the longest river, the Nile, but there's some stuff that I'm about to tell you that not many people actually know about. Um, most of the world's diamond production and gold production comes from Africa. In 2022, Africa placed first when it came to um, diamond production and value when it was based on region and also talking about the, uh, how Africa is a major source of global gold. Another thing is that Africa is home or was home to the richest man to have ever lived. Mansa Musa was the 14th century emperor of the Mali Empire, granting him the just like a big source of gold, making him the richest man. But we don't actually see him in a lot of history books. I don't think I've ever seen him mentioned out of my own research. The West has also caused a lot of things. It's given us good things, but also bad um, things as well. There's the yellow filter that comes with any other country that isn't well developed in the eyes of the West. Um, we have here how Africa is often portrayed in movies and then Mexico and then the Middle East. It's just like, it's so funny because any time that they're mentioned, Africa is either placed as like a place with huts, which like some places do have, but when I tell you it's more developed than anything. Um, and it's also laughable the amount of ignorance that the people are shown to have. Another thing that the West has instilled in us is the fight between African and African Americans. Even in our communities, there's a hatred between those who are born in the US and those who have um, migrated to the US. It is entering a battle for a kingdom with us as jesters. It is us fighting and hurling insults as our pro projectiles with the catapults that the kings and queens have built and rebuilt for us just so we can fight between ourselves instead of join hand in hand. By no means is my speech a persuasion or anything, but it's just something that has to be brought up because it is something in my community that I see every single time. Another thing is the community in Ubuntu. Ubuntu is an African philosophy, um, which means humanity to others. One example of this is my country. In my country, there is a lot, like a hundred or something um, of tribes there. And, but every single one of them understands each other because we speak a simplified version of Arabic, which is how I know Arabic and how I can speak to those who speak um, different um, dialects of the same language. Again, Africa is not a country. It is a continent. And there are so many countries inside that continent. There's 40, no, there's 54 to be specific. And when we count the amount of 
tribes and tribal language, we find that it's 3,000 that are acknowledged. Now, I could go over all 54, but that's going to take me like three minutes and I don't have that much time. So I'm going to list the top countries by population. We have Nigeria, Ethiopia, Egypt, Democratic Republic of Congo, Tanzania, South Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Sudan, and Algeria. And before I move on to my last thing, I would like to show you a few um, African countries' traditional clothing. The first one is Cameroon. Um, I lived in Cameroon for about three months to get my papers to get to the U.S. And the second one is Ethiopia, which I think is a beautiful country. And they have their traditional clothing. And the last one is Chadian. For me, we wear something called um, lefaya, which is just a long cloth that you wrap around your body. But that is also one of the traditional clothes that you can find there. Hopefully, I've watered down and simplified a, just a small part of Africa for you. And I'm so glad to be able to call myself African in the United States. I am so proud of myself to stand here and be able to talk about something that I have not seen many people talk about. I'm so proud of myself for having mixed blood um, from different tribes. And I am so proud and glad that I've caught your attention until the very end. Thank you so much. All right, so today I got a tribute to the special occasion that's coming up this summer, which is the summer in Wisconsin. Wisconsin's a special place, so I want to give you a tribute to Wisconsin and their, uh, their beautiful tourism spots. Uh, their great gas station, if anyone knows about that, um, as well as the Wisconsin drivers, sadly. All right, so, so here we go. I got travel destinations, so that's the Wisconsin sign. Quick trip. Anyone's ever been to Quick Trip? Great gas station. All right, so first off, I want to do a tribute to uh, their beautiful landscape and tourism. So um, what we got here, we got uh, the rolling hills of the Driftless area, which is in the southwest corner of Wisconsin. Uh, it's a bunch of rolling hills that have come from when the glaciers were there. And um, next, we're going to move to the lakes. They got two lakes, uh, Lake Michigan and Lake Superior, which are the two great lakes. And they have beautiful shoreline, Lake Michigan with lots of sandy beaches and Lake Superior with a lot of rugged coastline like you can see up here in the corner. Um, and next uh, we're going to go to, uh, Wisconsin is actually home to more than 15,000 lakes, which is 5,000 more than Minnesota, which is the land of lakes. They claim to have the most lakes, but Wisconsin has 15,000. Um, it's also home to the Mississippi River Valley, as well as three professional sports teams, known as the Green Bay Packers, Milwaukee Brewers, and the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, let's see what else we got here. I believe that's it for the tourism. Next, we're going to go to gas stations. A quick trip, one of my favorite gas stations. I don't get much when I'm here. I like to go in and get a water. But you get to interact with all the locals. And it's a place, it's part of uh, Wisconsin culture. Um, they have great staff. They make fresh baked, uh, like baked goods every day. So they got good donuts. They're, uh, if anyone's ever been to Krispy Kreme, they have really good um, glazed donuts. Actually, it might be better. Um, in Wisconsin and Minnesota, they're known as Quick Trip. Illinois, Iowa, and Minnesota, or I'm sorry, not Minnesota. The Dakotas, they're known as Quick Star. Um, and it was recently voted as the best gas station in the U.S. by um, ABC, I believe. And Wisconsin drivers, it's one of the biggest uh, problems I have with the state of Wisconsin. I drive to the state of Wisconsin about four times a week in the summer, and they are sitting in the left lane doing 70 miles an hour the whole entire time. And that is wrong. You're going to cause accidents with that. So I, I wanted to explain. Uh, I use the lane. So the left lane here is only for passing. This lane here is also only for passing. If it's more than two lanes uh, over here on the right, or the lanes you're supposed to be sitting in unless you're going to be passing people. Two lane road, use the right lane here. But uh, Wisconsin driver is one of the worst drivers on the road. And in Minnesota, they happen to do it on purpose to Illinois drivers to sit in the left lane. Um, and we are known in Wisconsin as FIPS, so frickin', but there's another word, Illinois people. And that's what we are known as in Wisconsin. So I want to attribute that to we the people of Illinois towards Wisconsin. And that is all I have. We go. I believe that's it. Yep. It's said that animals are our best companions. And ever since I was a child, I've always wanted a dog. 
Uh, throughout my childhood, I watched a lot of cartoons, and a lot of the times, a main character always had a fluffy companion with them. Years later, I received the best gift I ever could have given my own self. And at times, I wonder if it was meant to be, if the stars and planets were aligned just right that day, what would have happened if I didn't ask my mom to stop by the store, if, I, if my mom had said no, or if I had spent all the money I was saving throughout the summer. This is my dog, Zoe. Um, I got Zoe exactly on July 22nd of 2019. I was 15 years old at this time, and I impulsively got Zoe after a dentist appointment. I wasn't planning to get a dog that day, but when I had seen her for the first time, I just knew I could not leave without her. Zoe is a Jack Russell Terrier Beagle Mix, also known as a Jacoby. I don't know why the name is like that, but it's a silly name. And, but it's very fitting because they are such loyal dogs. They are very vocal. So she's a big barker, but she's overall such a kind and loving dog. Something I will recommend about before even getting an animal is researching about the animal. I impulsively got Zoe. I did not do any research, and I had to find out the hard way of how this breed manages. And it is true what people say about having your first dog. Within the few first months, two years, they're very chaotic. But as time goes on, they eventually calm down. Some of Zoe's favorite activities conclude napping, eating. We have another dog, and she loves bossing her around. She loves playing, she loves going on long walks, and she even likes listening to music with me and watching movies with me. And by that, I mean I watch the movie and she sleeps. She is so lazy and she is my nap buddy. No matter anything that happens in my life, I always think I cannot wait to go home to go see my Zoe. There is never a time that I don't think about her. If I have even the opportunity to talk about her, I'm going to talk about her. Um, I would consider Zoe to be one of my bestest friends. That kind of sounds like a sad statement to say, but this is an animal. This is someone who I can just look at and know you will never judge me. You will never think badly of me, that you will love me no matter what, and that is such a gift to really be able to experience. Zoe turns five this year on July 6th, and as we both grow older, it's harder for me to know that in due time, she will pass. I don't know when, but it doesn't mean that I can't enjoy every single minute we have together. And soon enough, all the potty accidents, the chewed chapsticks, or any of the barking that she does that's unwanted, that immediately goes away when I remember that she only has at best maybe like dog's lifespan is like 15 years, if not less. I can care less about that. I care more about her. And despite that I trained Zoe to do better, she also trains me to become better. Bygones will be bygones when you have a sweet companion who you will love and care for. Within my life, reaching new highs and lows, Zoe has physically been there. Despite her not even being able to say anything to me or even give me some form of advice, I still appreciate her presence. And as a young adult as well, I've gone through a few breakups, rejection letters, and a few breakdowns in my life. Tough luck, but I know that Zoe will be there as long as she stands. <laughs> in conclusion, although I can express more sentiment about Zoe, which I can, uh, I just want to say that we truly do not deserve our pets. We, they don't even understand the impact that they have on our lives. And despite that there's not a single thought flowing through her head, I will forever love her regardless of anything. If you do have an animal at home, make sure to always give them that love. Even if you don't have an animal at home, have a compassion for animals. If that changes, you're going to love your first pet. Zoe is my first dog, and I know that her significance in life is going to impact me for the rest of mine. Thank you. <laughs>
This is making me more nervous. Okay. Do I? Good? Okay. Good morning. My name is Ariana Rodriguez. And today I would like to pay tribute to something that every single one of us and our ancestors can relate to. It's something that some people may even rely on on a daily basis, whether, um, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. Um, I know sometimes I don't acknowledge it, but I do depend on it. So what exactly am I talking about here? You can probably see since the presentation isn't working properly. I'm talking about music. So music is something that has been around for literal decades and has changed so much throughout the years, whether it is all the genres that makes it capable for everybody and anybody to find something that they like. So today I would like to discuss the benefits of music and what they have for me and possibly every single one of you as well. So some of the main things that music stands out with is the fact that it is able to set a calm mindset for several people and it is able to help you set a tone for the day. Not only that, but it also focuses on its wide selection of not only diversity, but including um, times, ages, and um, culture as well. So music can be seen as something to relax your mind. It is something that people depend on and can like, like mentions at the tone for the day based on preferences. Some people may listen to their instrumental music while they're in a work environment because they just can't focus with lyrics in the background. Or people could listen to hard rock because they want to just de-stress and feel free and maybe belt out a song or two in your car, whether you're a good singer or not. I know I'm not a good singer, but that doesn't stop me from belting out in the car every now and then to you know de-stress a little bit before I have to do something that really takes a lot of mentality. Um, not only that, but music has also been shown to help people cope with high levels of anxiety, which I think is actually very fascinating when you think about it. There's so many capabilities that it has for your mentality, and sometimes we just overglance all of those um, things. Okay. And then one of the greatest things about music is the diversity that it brings. You can be born in the 2000s and listen to music from the 80s and the 90s, and no one can say anything about it because music and time don't essentially correlate. Um, I was literally at work yesterday and I was listening to like Michael Jackson and Bon Jovi and everybody was having a great time. Nobody was like, oh my god, you're not even old enough to be born that time, you know? So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, something else that I think is very important is the diversity that it brings, whether it's bringing people together or just setting people back to their initial roots. Um, whether it is like people listening to music of their mother tongue in order to recreate, regain those roots or just feel more comfortable. As someone um, from a Hispanic household, I know that I, I even learned how to pronounce some words in Spanish as a child. I couldn't roll my R's, and just based on singing, I was able to, you know, like I said, I didn't sing well, but I did figure out how to roll the R's, which I thought was pretty cool, you know. It got me a little bit more into what I was essentially born with. So to me, I think that Music is like a loyal friend. It's there for you whenever you need it, however you need it. Whether you're in a sad mood, you're in a happy mood, you're angry, or just need to calm down a little bit. So whether you're simply streaming it on Spotify, Apple Music, the, listening to it on the car, you can even hear it in the streets from performers, or it's just blasting in a stereo on a plaza. Music will always be there for you, and I think that that is something that has taught me a lot, and i really grown to appreciate. So I hope you all agree. So sorry for that presentation. Let me, how do I, there we go. Now, I know she just did the same thing, but I want to pay tribute to music as well. Um, music, it just holds so much power in today's day and age, you know? You listen to it when you're sad. You listen to it to make you feel happy, you know? It can really uplift you and just overall change the overall mood. What, specifically like this, for instance. What is a party without music? It's dull, dreary. It can be relatively boring, right? Not only that, but you know, music also just inspires people. It's a great way of telling stories, sending a message, and just overall, it can even just invoke many or very much emotion in many people at once, especially when they all come together to enjoy it as one. Now if I... So the power of music, like I just mentioned, the ability to invoke emotion, send a message, and even tell stories. Nowadays, a lot of the music that gets made 
actually holds a story behind it or even just trying to send a message. It's actually a lot of inspiration. It's actually inspiration for a lot of people who make music. A few examples here I have of music telling a story is from my, one of my favorite bands, Sabaton. They create, uh, they create very, uh, different types of metal music, but a lot of it is also history-based. Like, for instance, uh, sometimes they'll uh, basically work together with a YouTube channel called Yarn Hub to create these animated story videos for, for, for their music, where uh, first, the first few minutes of the video will be Yar the narrator of Yarn Hub telling the story behind it before getting into the music, and then once again, Yarn Hub will come in at the end of the song to tell more of the story. For instance, No Bullets Fly. This song is actually about the story of Charlie Brown, and no, I don't mean the cartoon character. There was an actual man named Charlie Brown who was the pilot of a B-17 during World War II flying, uh, doing a bombing run over Bremen, Germany. On that day, they were shown mercy by a German fighter pilot uh, due to the severe amount of damage done to their plane. That German fighter pilot was none other than Franz Stiegler. What he did is he flew in close formation with the B-17, escorting them out of uh, enemy territory over any sort of air defenses or anything like that. Due to his close formation with the B-17, no, f no form of anti-air artillery or anything was fired at them due to the fact that if they did, they would have likely hit their, uh, they would have likely hit Franz Stiegler. He, Franz Stiegler risked his life in many ways that day, as a quote from Yarn Hub. One of the few things being, he didn't know whether or not the guns on that plane still worked. He could have been shot down by the B-17 and Charlie Brown's crew. However, at the same time, if anybody actually found out what he had done that day on the German side, he likely could have been executed or even sent to a concentration camp or even a prison. The second one here is of the Red Baron. Uh, not many people tend to know the Red Baron's name, but his name was Manfred, Vo Manfred von Richthofen. He was a World War I fighter ace. Actually, one of the best. His story is probably one of the most legendary within World War I. Near the end of his time in the war, he was eventually shot down. However, he was actually, despite being the enemy and despite the amount of trouble he caused for the Allied forces at that time, he was treated with respect and actually given uh, buried with military honors by the Allies. How, uh, there's also the fact, that like I mentioned before, that music is capable of inducing emotion. For instance, I put Saw and Bluey up here. For Saw, as we all know, it's a horror movie. Music tends to be used in a more uh, tense sort of like way to induce a, f a sense of fear or anxiety uh, in order to set tension within the movie. And that's how it is used in a lot of horror movies. So it's meant to get people in suspense for what's going to happen. Whether it happens or not, it, that feeling still remains. Something it will eventually happen. It's just a matter of when. Or Bluey. A kid's show, right? A cartoon. These shows tend to have songs that, when that open up to the show, you know, which tend to have a nice, upbeat tone with lyrics, which, a lot of the time, you'll see kids will sing along or even dance all the while having a complete smile on their face, maybe even laughing. The songs there are meant to induce joy and make and anticipation for the show. Overall, music holds so much power in our world today that some people may not even notice it and or even notice the stories or messages that they're telling, which there's nothing wrong with that. You know, sometimes you just want to listen to a song just to listen to a song or listen to music and just enjoy it and have a good time. I enjoy listening to music. It has helped me so much through so many times. You know, whenever I'm stressed, I, I listen to it to relax. To, uh, sometimes when I'm feeling sad, maybe I'll listen to it to make me happy or when I actually feel I need to cry or feel sad, yet I'm having a struggle, uh, struggling to... 
uh, show or do that, I'll listen to maybe a sad song just to help me get through it. Because sometimes it's better to express that emotion rather than bottle it up. In conclusion, music is one of the was one of world's uh, one of the world's greatest things ever created, and I'm happy to that we could all listen to it and share it with each other, and share these messages and stories together. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Josie, and today we are here to honor and remember and pay tribute to a man that shaped the very nature of the entertainment industry through his films and his theme parts. That man, of course, is Walt Disney. Walt Disney was born in Dece on December 5th, 1901, in our very own Chicago, Illinois. Um, Walt always knew that he wanted to be a cartoonist. He always knew that he wanted to make something bigger than himself. When he was just seven years old, he was drawing and selling his uh, he was drawing and selling his sketches to his neighbors, um, and he knew that he wanted to be a cartoonist. Him and his brother Roy started their company, um, and some of his major achievements. From that studio, um, he produced the first synchronized and sound cartoon, Steamboat Willie, in 1928. Um, he also produced the first uh, featured animated, uh, pic animated picture called Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And he also created some of the most famous characters that we know. We obviously know Mickey Mouse, but he also created Donald Duck as well and Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. And then as a pioneer, Walt was a pioneer of an animated cartoon films. Uh, he knew that he wanted, um, he knew that he wanted to create something bigger. So in also when he created his films and his uh, animations, he also knew that he wanted to create something bigger than himself. So he created the theme parks. That's when it started. Uh, he knew that he wanted to create a place where because when he was a father, he knew that when he was always with his daughters, he sat there, but there was no rides for him. So he created rides for himself. And so that's why we have Disneyland and Disney World. But Walt died in uh, December 15, 1966. So he died before Disneyland opened, but his memory still remains. Um, on a personal note, I have, um, I relate to uh, Walt Disney and everything because I actually worked for the Walt Disney Company. I uh, what <laughs> I did the Walt uh, the Disney College program last year, 2022 to 2023. Um, I started as a cast member for um, food and beverage for six months, and the other six months I actually worked in the entertainment industry. So Walt Disney really has a big role in my life. Not only did I work at his park, but I also grew up going to the parks. I go every year with my family. And I also, um, I also, we always were raised on his movies, his films, those sing-alongs, all that. And so there's me up there with my sister and, of course, at the graduation right there. Walt Disney also has 22 Academy Awards just in his lifetime alone. Uh, that includes honorary. He also has two Golden Globes. And Walt always knew that however magical a place is built to be, the people make that dream come true. And that's why I have a really big um, care and understanding for Walt Disney because that's why I wanted to work for his company. And that's why I wanted to talk to you guys today about him. His parks have really showed me and showed everyone um, the love and the care that you can have into building something so special and the bond and the memories you can have just on having a film. We all know his films. We all know his company. Even if he didn't have a, a play in it when he was alive, he still put his hands in it before it was even there. So just to remember this man and to really honor his, tr his success and his love for movies and film, and also just for families to bond, to love, to share. So, and Walt always said it started with a mouse, but we all know it started with Walt first. Thank you so much. Okay. 
Hello, my name is Angelina, and today I want to talk to you guys about my grandpa, Richard Konecki, who passed away this fall due to cancer. My grandfather was a Vietnam veteran early in his life, and for the rest of it, as far as I know, he was a CMC machinist. So he worked in factories and dealt with machines, cutting steel, stuff like that. He never really talked about it. He never even really talked about his time in, as a Marine in the Vietnam War. But what he did love to talk about was nature. He, he loved picking mushrooms, and he knew where was the best place to go, when to go, which ones were poisonous, which ones were safe. He was teaching me this as, like, I was, like, four years old going in the woods with him, figuring out, oh, is this one good? No, don't touch that. <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious. He knew the best spots, and we usually went to Michigan, so those were the, that's where we would always go. He loved catching fish, frogs, crawfish, and whatever else you could catch. I remember growing up, I'd bring a net, and we'd always catch frogs. Like, we'd, he had the specific spot. With, it was just like a little pond, like about a mile into the trail, and we'd catch like so many frogs. And I'd bring them home, and I'd scare my grandma, absolutely scare her because she hated them. Uh, he loved to cook, especially grill. His face would always light up when he saw everyone eating his delicious food. He even taught me, um, he taught me every one of these things, and I loved every second of it. Picking mushrooms to catching my first fish, he was there for it and teaching me how to become just as skilled as him. My grandpa had the kindest heart, and he was always there to lend a hand and help someone who needed it. When I didn't have money for my prom dress, he took me shopping and waited for me just to find the bright dress and buy it for me. Um, when I lost my dad, he showed up every week with food just to check up on me and make sure I was okay. He even surprised me and my younger sister with a spontaneous trip to Wisconsin Dells uh, to lift our spirits. He t we were there for about a week. We did boat tours. We went to Mount Olympus. We did so much there. I was completely, I was completely in my own world, happy, forgot about everything going on. It was, it was great. And then a year later, he even took us to Florida. And that was awesome because I've never, I never got to travel until then. My grandpa was a big handyman. He would constantly renovate my grandparents' house. He would paint the rooms every couple of years. I swear, every couple of years, he was painting the walls in the kitchen, the bedrooms. He was just constantly renovating it. I have no idea why, but he was. He redid their entire bathroom. He did the tiles. He did the floors. He added uh, the new furniture in there, like the bathtub and the counters and the sinks. He did all of that. He also redid the kitchen about a year and a half ago where he did the cabinets, the fridge, the countertops, did all the lighting. It was, it was beautiful. The last thing he was working on, which unfortunately he didn't finish, was the basement. He put up an entire wall, a sliding door area, and even did half of the light fixtures for it. <sighs> My grandpa touched everyone's lives around him. He always knew how to help no matter the problem. He showed me how to do my first oil change and check the fluids in my car. He taught my sister how to catch frogs. He would help my mom whenever she needed help putting together new furniture. He would and then he would also surprise my grandma with her favorite flowers every couple of months. He loved me and my family so much. Thank you, Grandpa, for giving me such a wonderful lifetime of unforgettable memories. One day I hope to see you again. Until then, I know you'll always be watching over me and everyone else in my family, making sure we're all safe. Thank you. Have you ever felt something resent res present to you in some way, maybe an object, a color, photo. Well, something that represents me, it's a tiger, feelings. In my case, it's connected to my identity and my strong characteristics in my family. I bought that portrait a year ago and when I saw it, I saw something so similar to my art. 
It was the colors, the tiger. I felt immediate connection with it. And I never knew that I would be connected to such an animal, a strong one. And this example right here, that is something that I did and it inspired me to do portraits of myself. I was in my AP art, I was really lost. They will tell me, what do you connect with? In your investigation topic, I was confused. I never knew that a tiger would be such something so important in my life. It helped me sort out my emotions when I drew art and when I, sh when I showed that I was connected to feelings. It came to my mind how it connected to my mother who had cancer, thyroid cancer and breast cancer. And from there, I thought to myself, wow, I came from a such strong mother. And now I know why I connect to that tiger so much in my room that I see every single day. Those stripes represent the feminine me, the strong woman I am on, I am today. That color represents my family and all my family members who had cancer, which are five of them, and have died. And today it has shaped me to be a strong woman and talk about a such sensitive topic to me. And I wanted to tell everybody that everybody can be strong in their own ways. Maybe nobody has find themselves still, but there's always chance to find yourself. Um, even if you're 40, 50, there's always a chance to connect to something so deeply. Like I'm connected to this tiger and what led me to love art and show my emotions through it and inspire a lot of women who right now are not being their full self or try to hide their feminine essence. I want to say, and I'm here to tell that everything is possible, even though life is hard. Art, maybe something can inspire you to go further. This painting I see every day is what I bring today as my artifact. Every single day I see, and I'm so thankful to my art class that made me, made me discover what I am connected to. This portrait has shown me the, the emotions I went through when my family had cancer, my mother, and thankfully she survived. And she's a woman, today is my role model, who is alive and has always been strong and shown me the love of being a woman and my family's characteristic who is in my blood, who have shown me today who I am. Maybe today you don't know who are you, but you will find it sh shortly. And I want to understand you better and know your worth and become the best version of yourself. And the most important values I've learned through is that being a strong feminine woman is not a weakness. Thank you. All right, let's start. <laughs> okay, hi everyone, my name is Chad and I'm, so my topic for today is hum humility. So Himeli got me thinking, and I hope it does the same for you. So let's just spread the feelings um, together. So today I want to um, talk about something really important, humility. It's a big word, and it's a huge thing in our life. 
Uh, but it's also about being humble, which means uh, not thinking you are better than others. Um, so imagine a world everyone was uh, uh, humble instead of uh, showing off. Uh, we'll listen to each other, um, work with each other, and being uh, kind with each other too. Um, it's like when you are play a game with your friends, um, but instead of uh, win by alone, it's just um, helping each other. Oh. So yeah, that's sorry. I I, I forgot to get to. <laughs> um, so what is humility? So humility is a superpower that helps us to understand each other uh, better. Um, it reminds us that we are uh, we are all part uh, of being bigger and <laughs> should be thankful for what we have, and we are humble, um, and we are and we were open to learning from others. Um, we know that we don't have uh, all the answers for any questions or any helps, but that's okay. It's like being a student in a school. Um, um, just you are always learning and getting new thoughts and new new things that you have nowhere and you should like uh, give it to uh, like people who are asking for it and that's what uh, makes life exist. Um, think about people you look up to um, to they are not the ones who brag all the times they are uh, the ones who are uh, kind and treat uh, with uh, everyone with respect. Um, that's because humility makes people more um, likable and trustworthy. Uh, and we are humble. Uh, we are open to learning from others. Uh, we know that we don't have all the answer and that's okay. You just give what you have to the people who are asking you. Um, so let's just try to be a little humble and let's try to uh, listen for each other and help each other and remember that we are uh in we are in the we are in this together because we are humble uh, we make the world a better place for everyone and that's all i have for you thank you Okay, um, I'm Jaden, and I'm gonna be doing my speech over my mom. Uh, I know it's kind of a generic type of person to do a tribute speech over, because you know, like people do this a lot. But I didn't know any other person to do it over. Um, so I'm just start from the beginning. Um, my mom had, had me when she was 18, and she was playing basketball at the same time. Uh, she was actually playing basketball while she was pregnant with me. And um, I think that kind of like brought me into what I am today. Um, she also was, well, was a single parent for 13 years of my life before she got married. Um, after I want to say we we actually we lived in Arkansas for I would say eight years, and then after that we moved to Texas. We moved to Houston, Texas, and uh, there she got her master's degree, and um, I used that as like inspiration because she did all, she did all that by herself. Um, she would risk leaving me at home by myself at 10. And um, so that she can go to school, get her master's and do all of the et cetera. Um, this next slide is, this next slide is my, uh, my cousin I just lost uh, last year. Um, It was really hard during this time because it was like so unexpected and he was only 15 years old and he was very close to me. Um, and my mom helped me through this. 
just by staying there for me. And she was very supportive as well. And also just, I don't want to stay on this slide too, too long, so I'm going to move on to the next. And I thank her for giving me my two siblings that I have today. This is uh, my little sister, Harley, and my little brother, Cash. Cash is four, and Harley just turned one um, in June. Um, they both bring on, like, a roller coaster in my life. One day, they're chill. The next day, they're trying to, like, draw on the wall or something. But um, I just use my mom as inspiration to keep going no matter what the circumstances are. And just keep pushing myself to be the greatest person I can be. That's it. Can I take it? Like a hold it? I don't want to keep it in there. Sorry. <laughs> Hi guys, today I'm going to speak about Palestine, where I'm from today. And with all the the stuff that's going around, all the war and stuff. We're going to talk about it and make focus on the history and what Palestine actually is. We're going to ignore about what's going on. In the last um, assignment, we actually talked about the war and we covered everything. But today, I'm going to cover about the history, the, cl um, the clothes, and the traditional stuff that we do. And for some, um, some points, there is some uh, meanings for the flags or for the clothes and everything. So we're gonna talk about it right now in, in my slide. So this is the map for Palestine. Uh, this is in 1946 when the um, occupation started at Palestine. Palestine was a fully called Palestine. Then for um, Gaza Strip and some of uh, places in Palestine in 1947, it was still under a Palestine government. And some of it is again occupied under uh, from uh, from Israel army. And in 1967, Palestine was like only a couple of countries with Gaza Strip. And in 2010, it was like actually two country, uh, two cities, and Gaza Strip was one of them that was under Palestinian government. Otherwise, it was occupied fully from uh, from Israel. But right now, in 2024, it's actually the war between Gaza only and Israel. So actually, Palestine is only about Gaza. Otherwise, the whole, ma the whole cities and everything in Palestine right now called Israel, suddenly. And I'm going to talk about the kufiyya, that what we wore. Sometimes when we want to show about uh, our freedom or we want to speak up about Palestine, or want to speak up about our country, where it's our families, our parents, or our grandfathers are from, and to talk about the history that they left and what they actually went through and what they actually have been told about Palestine, about the war. It was actually going to be one, two weeks, and after that, you're going to come back to your houses, you're going to go back to your houses, and everything will be fine. Nothing will happen, nothing will change. And after 74 years until now, none of my parents, none of our grandfathers and mothers are back to their houses, and they keep pushing us back off, uh, out from Palestine, keep stealing our houses, keep stealing our land, and killing some of us. So right now, the Kufiya, it's, uh, there is a three um, signs in it. One of them is the olives. The olives uh, trees right here, it is the economy of Palestine. The Palestine are about olives. And the most popular plant in Palestine was an olive oil. The olive and the oil and the, of the olive. And the blunt lines is just like the article trade uh, road. And right here, what is sewing, it's the, it's, it's just a sign for how it goes between the other, the like uh, Palestinian cities and uh, Israeli occupied cities right now. So there was like a, and a wall or like I can say, and um, yeah, we can describe it as a wall. It looked like that. So the Palestinian people cannot cross it to go to the real like a uh, other Palestinian cities. 
And right now, I'm going to talk about the traditional clothes in Palestine. The clothes generally talk, every city does have a different clothes, different type of clothes, different colors, different, um, um, we call it, it's like how it look like and how we how it look like in the dress. So in a different colors, different designs, and a different um, way to wear it. So I can see right here. I'm gonna talk about my cities. So this is the most uh, cities that I know about it. It's Janine. So this is how uh, this right here how we uh, wear the uh, top. It called. This is we wear in our weddings and um, holidays sometimes in our visits and. Um, a family's um, families visiting, like it's something that we feel more um, more power and more uh, broad when we wear it. Feel like, like feeling giving the the idea about what Palestinians are as not just wearing this thing. It means um, just terrorist people and blah 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 stories. We don't have to talk about it today. <laughs> And this is a picture of a wedding in Palestine. It just a uh, man sometimes wearing um, the regular clothes of a wedding. But the grandma's right here. She's wearing it with uh, a specific signs in it that like a triangles with uh, some colors. Uh, even the like the girls, little girls are wearing the same. It's a different shapes from the um, old people, and that's actually one of the. Nice to think in my culture. And this is, I'm sorry. <laughs> so this is one of the oldest pictures that was telling about the stories and they were, how they were actually wearing the clothes and how it actually looked like before. Um, the new uh, genders and everything. So this is how it looked like. And actually Palestine does have a lot of stories, does have a lot of um, information does have a lot of things that to learn but we only have four minutes I couldn't say more than that but if you like search it up look it up have any questions just let us know the people who actually know who live there we will be more than more than, more than you will be more than welcome to ask any question and we will be excited to answer your question we are all proud of being Palestinians and we are proud to answer any question about Palestine free Palestine Thank you.